Welcome back to Singapore tonight. If you're just joining us, here are our top stories this evening. Two more cases of the Wuhan coronavirus confirmed here in Singapore, taking the total to three so far. One of the new cases is the 37-year-old son of the first confirmed case. The other is a 53-year-old woman. All three patients are from Wuhan. And temperature screening has begun at Singapore's land and sea checkpoints. Changi Airport had already started this on Wednesday for passengers on all flights from China. Now joining us tonight in the studio is Professor Paul Tambaya. He's president of the Asia Pacific Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infection. Well, Professor, thank you very much for coming in and speaking to us. So we have three cases in Singapore right now. Let's look at the latest one because um, the woman, let's right. use her as an example. Sure. We know that she stayed at a hotel near Jalan Besar. She visited Orchard Road. She went to Marina Bay Sands. She went to um, Gardens by the Bay. She traveled by public transport, um, MRT, public buses, and all this while she was ill. Right. So how difficult is it to do contact tracing in this situation? Well, it's obviously really difficult to find out who are the people who are in close contact with her. But on the other hand, when we know where she's been, it, um, it's very helpful for the doctors and for the individuals themselves. So, you know, if somebody comes to you who's sick, who's got a cough or a fever that won't go away, then you could ask them, were you in Marina Bay Sands over the, over the weekend? Uh, and for the patients themselves, you know, if you are sitting next to a tourist who's uh, coughing away and then four days later you develop a fever, you can tell your GP, you know, hey, maybe uh, I caught something from that tourist sitting next to me. Professor, let's look at what's being done uh, in various countries, including Singapore, the use of thermal scanners. But we do know that in the case of at least two of the inf of infected uh, patients, they didn't present with fever mm. at all. So, you know... How else are we going to be able to identify these potentially uh, you know, dangerous viral infections? Well, you know, I've never been a great fan of thermal scanners. And in fact, I was quite surprised that the Thais picked up two cases um, just on thermal scanning in the airport. Mm -hmm. um, but I think thermal scanners do have a purpose because they, they remind you that you shouldn't be traveling when you're sick. Uh, and, you know, when you walk through the thermal scanners, there's always advice to seek medical attention if you feel unwell. So ultimately, I think it's just going to boil down to people going to their doctors and, and getting the uh, uh, treatment that they need and referrals that they need. So the, we can't really tell when the person is going to fall ill um, right. because, you know, as we, as we were saying that, you know, they didn't show any symptoms. Sure. So you also mentioned previously when we were talking that there is an incubation period. Right. When is this individual most uh, contagious? when he or she displays the symptoms already or during the incubation period? Yeah, now we don't really know that for sure for this particular virus, but for SARS and MERS, we do know that it's most infectious when the patients are really sick. So there is a spectrum, you know, like with chickenpox, you can be infectious even before you get symptoms. Mm. Whereas with Ebola, you're most infectious when you're dead because the transmissions have occurred at funerals and at, uh, people handling corpses. So SARS and MERS are closer to Ebola in that sense, in that uh, it's when people are sick that the viral load is very, uh, very high, and that's when they appear to be the most contagious. Mm. So give us your take now on what we're seeing in terms of the profile of, of the patients, because mm. we keep hearing this, that it's older men who've been infected and, and people with pre-existing conditions, but we've only got a sample of 26 people so far. We don't know a lot in fact, about these individuals. And we do know at least one of them was 36 years old, at least this is what we're hearing from reports, and he had no pre-existing conditions, no health issues prior. Right, um, I think what you're referring to is the death. Uh, mm -hmm. And there was actually, a, the, the Chinese National Health Commission published a list, uh, a very detailed listing of the individuals and the average age was of those who died, and the average age was 73. Uh, it ranged all the way up to 89. The 36-year-old was an exception, but the 48-year-old was somebody who had chronic medical conditions, and, and most of the others were over the age of 60. So there are people getting infected at younger ages, but the people who get severe disease and die tend to be the older ones. And that actually is similar to what happened with SARS. You know, we had young nurses and, and uh, doctors and healthcare workers getting infected, but the people who died tended to be the elderly patients. Mm -hmm. So take us through what happens uh, when a suspect case you know, is uh, um, identified. So a test is done immediately. How long does it actually take uh, for the results to be confirmed, you know, et cetera? So the Ministry of Health has a set of case definitions, and these have recently been updated. They've been sent around to all GPs and emergency rooms. So what happens is if you have a fever and cough that hasn't gone away, you go to your GP. And then your GP is familiar with the, the case definition, 
And then what he will do will try and determine whether you have pneumonia or not. And if you do have pneumonia and you have recently traveled from China, or you've been in contact in a place where one of those three uh, Wuhan virus patients has been, then he can call a dedicated ambulance. Then the dedicated ambulance will take you over to the National Center for Infectious Disease, where the doctors there will confirm the GP suspicion, and then they will do a swab test from your nose or your throat. And within hours, actually, within about five to six hours, you'll get the result. And if the preliminary result is positive, you get a confirmatory test done. So the whole process takes uh, less than 24 hours, actually, about 12 to 24 hours from recognition by the GP to uh, confirmation of diagnosis. And that's what we've seen for these three patients. They've been relatively quick in terms of uh, identifying the patients. And during that time, uh, the key is to have these people in isolation. Mm. So while we see these numbers continuing to change every day and the number of countries impacted change, we do know that research teams are already working on test kits for this particular virus and also working on perhaps a vaccine which would be critical uh, at this juncture. But what kind of time frame are we looking at for that to actually happen? Well, test kits will come out pretty quickly, but the key for a test kit is it has to be accurate. You know, everyone says, oh, I can do this test in 15 minutes. And I say, look, you know, if you do it in 15 minutes and you're wrong 10% of the time, I'm not interested. Uh, vaccines, unfortunately, will take months to years because you've got to do clinical trials. You've got to do your studies in animals. You've got to make sure the vaccine is safe. Um, and so I don't think that we're going to have that. You know, we don't have a vaccine for, uh, for SARS 17 years later. Exactly. Um, Professor, really quickly, really sure. quickly, I want to ask you, what's your take on the WHO deciding not to declare this a um, global health emergency for now? Well, you know, the WHO did, said that they're not declaring a global health emergency yet. And they did say it's a, a, it's a public health emergency in China. And I think part of the reason is because it hasn't affected low-income countries just yet. The benefit of having a global health emergency is it mobilizes resources for, for low- and middle-income countries. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, SARS didn't really affect low-income countries. But countries like, you know, Japan, Singapore, Thailand, they're able to cope with... Uh, uh, diseases like this. Thank you so much for coming in and speaking to us. We've been seeing Professor Paul Tambaya, President of the Asia Pacific Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infection.